Welcome to Too Fond of Books. My name is Janelle and this is a reading roundup. Now, don't worry, Murder Mystery Mondays are coming back. I just needed to put this video today because I needed to clear house for March Mystery Madness. So, um, the books that uh, I've read recently, there's a bunch in here or some in here that aren't mysteries and I just wanted to clear the decks. So, Murder Mystery Mondays are coming back, and for March Mystery Madness, I've souped them up. It's going to be great, um, so you have that to look forward to. But for right now, let's just get into the books that I read. I reread The Man in the Brown Suit by Agatha Christie. First of all, isn't this cover fantastic? I love that the this necklace the, or the diamonds are in the shape of a skull. I think that's so great. So I was I was tempted to reread this because I read the graphic novel of The Man in the Brown Suit for the Library Love Readathon, and uh, that just reminded me how much I, I did enjoy the story. And so I went back and I reread this one, and I love it. This is an early Agatha Christie from the twenties, and it's an adventure story. It's the very first Colonel Race, um, and I just I just love it. Uh, you know, there's travel in it and uh, some intrigue and some romance and like it's just a great it's a great mystery. It's one of my favorites. Okay. And then I read Wouldn't It Be Deadly by D.E. Ireland. This is also a reread. It's the first in the Eliza Doolittle and Henry Higgins um, mystery series. And I reread this because, well, because I had it and I wanted to, but I also had the second one out from the library that I wanted to, that I wanted to read. So this one um, also I read for the Library Love Readathon. No, I didn't. It was the second one. <laughs> so this was a reread for me, like I said, but it, it was, it's been years and years and years since I read this one. I just remembered really, really liking it. So I started reading this one and I was about 60 or so pages into it. And I thought, I was thinking to myself, I wonder how close the authors are staying to the play Pygmalion by George Bernard, or by George, by Bernard Shaw, sorry. And um, because it had been like over 20 years since I'd read the play. And, and so I was curious, I thought, I wonder how true they're staying to the, to the, the characters and the tone and all of that. So I put this book down for um, a bit and I grabbed the play Pygmalion by Bernard Shaw. I read this um, in college um, and you can tell because it's got notes uh, I wrote on the pages inside. Um, and I really enjoyed this play. It's really fun. It's very, like, it's very witty and quick paced. And I did really enjoy the play. And what I discovered was that the pair of writers who wrote Wouldn't It Be Deadly knew the play really well and honored it, I believe, in, in their historical mystery. They stayed very true to the characters and the way that they were drawn in the play and they stayed true to the tone um, so that it's, even though it's it's a historical, it's a still a mystery, but it is fairly lighthearted. Although, to be to be fair, it's also true to the time period. So they, I, I feel like they, um, they balance that really well of, of the lightheartedness with also being true to the time period. It's set in 1913. And in Wouldn't It Be Deadly, um, Eliza is now working um, as a voice coach, essentially, for um, Mr. And I can never say his name right, Mr. Nepomuk, um, who we met meet in the play, and uh, and then of course he gets murdered, and her someone used one of her. Um, tuning forks, <laughs> I forgot the word for a second, uh, and shoved it in his mouth or something. Um, so yeah, I I just really loved this. Um, I thought it was fantastic. Uh, they gave a nice nod to Audrey Hepburn, who was in the movie My Fair Lady, um, by naming uh, a house that they visit in the book. It's, they call it Hepburn House. Um, so I thought that was nice. 
Um, they kept way more of the characters from Pygmalion than I had than I had remembered. So when I first started reading it, obviously I I, I knew Eliza Doolittle and Henry Higgins. I thought that was just it. But Freddie and Clara are in here. Colonel Pickering, Mrs. Pierce, Mrs. Higgins, Nepomuk, and even Dimitri Collis, who I don't know if he gets named in the play, but he's a, he's a Greek diplomat, and I could tell. Um, from the descriptions that it's the same, it's the same character. And they give another direct nod to Pink Balian on page 196. So let's see what that one was about. Higgins is talking to um, someone called Redstone and he says, uh, Higgins says, I didn't ask you and I knew better than anyone how hard Eliza, I know better than anyone how hard Eliza has worked. I wonder, says Redstone, Yusima at times like Pygmalion with his Galatia. Redstone picked up his port, glass of port. If I recall the myth correctly, Pygmalion fell in love with his creation. I suspect that you have as well. So I love that there was just that little nod to, um, to the play. Okay, and then I read Date with Death by Julia Chapman. This is a mystery set in the Yorkshire Dales, which is one of the main things that attracted me to this story initially. And I read this, this also fit for the Library Love Readathon for Catherine's pairings, uh, Warm Drink, Something Sweet, and something Try Something New. It fit for all three of those. I also um, put it for two people on the cover. And, and that's it. Okay. So um, in this one, we meet uh, Delilah, who runs the Dales Dating Agency, and um, uh, she has ec an extra office in the building that she desperately needs to rent out because she is really struggling financially. And so she gets really excited when she finds out that there is someone who is going to rent that office until she finds out who it is. And it's Samson, who used to live in the village, left under a massive cloud, and Delilah and her brothers especially are like really angry with him uh, for what happened. And it's, it's, it's him, he has come back and he is opening the Dale's detective agency <laughs> in the same building, so that, that's hilarious. He, when he left the village, he went to England, he ended up in London um, on the police force and he uh, was an undercover officer for a while, um, was really good at his job and he got snatched up by like the, the national crime squad and all of that stuff. And um, he has had to kind of uh, get out of Dodge for a while basically. And so he heads back up to, uh, to his home in the Dales. Anyway, um, there have been a couple of um, accidents, maybe murders, maybe suicides, but they are all connected to the dating agency, and so Delilah gets, is getting a little bit worried. I really enjoyed this. I thought it was great. It was good characters, um, really like complicated family dynamics, which you get in these smaller villages and towns where you have families who have lived there through the generations, right? And so there's like generational memory and generational feuds and all of that. Um, I, yeah, I, I quite enjoyed it. And then I read Murphy's Law by Reese Bowen. I read this um, as part of a mystery book club that I am uh, part of with Kate Howe and a lot of other fantastic, fantastic people. Um, this also fit the Library Love Readathon for a book that has a travel, travel or a journey. So this is a reread for me. Um, I read this years and years ago, but I really quite enjoyed this series. It's the first one in the Molly Murphy series. It's set um, at the turn, turn of the century, the very beginning of the 1900s, and Molly Murphy um, immigrates to the States, and um, someone on the boat gets murdered when they're on Ellis Island. Um, and so, of course, uh, she, she ends up getting involved. I really enjoyed this. This was a really great introduction to Molly Murphy, who is a fantastic character. I also really enjoyed um, the the parts where we learn like a little bit about that immigrant experience um, and Ellis Island. I, I loved it. I thought it was fantastic. And then I read a couple short stories from Oscar Wilde's short stories. I am reading through this with um, Donna, and we're reading two two a month. 
one of the longer ones and one of the one of the shorter ones. So um, we read Lord Ar Arthur Savile's Crime, which is one of the longer ones, um, and I I really enjoyed it. Um, there is a uh, reception at Lady Windermere's. Is there a connection to Lady Windermere's fan, the play? Like, is that the same person? I, I was curious. I don't even know. Anyway, and there's a whole bunch of people there, including someone who is a chiromantist. <laughs> and they kept getting it confused with the chiropodist, which is hilarious um, and classic. But it's someone who, uh, how do I introduce him? Like, you know, he's like a psychic. He reads their hands, all of that stuff, gives them their, their you know, fortunes or whatever. And um, Lord Ar Arthur Savile is told something by this psychic. And um, yeah, I don't want to say anymore. Uh, it, was, it was really good. I really did enjoy that one. And then a short one uh, called The Model Millionaire, uh, a short story about... Um, a, a man who is poor uh, but wants to marry and he has a friend who is an artist and he meets that artist's model uh, and uh, you know events ensue. So I've been really enjoying this buddy read with Donna and I am loving Oscar Wilde's short stories. He is fantastic. And then I did read the second in the Eliza Doolittle and Henry Higgins uh, series, Move Your Bloomin' Corpse, <laughs> which is such a great title. Um, so this fit the Library Love Readathon as, let me see, for a book, oh, continuous series that you have started, and a cover, the cover has a woman in period costume facing away. So there's two of them here with their backs to the, um, yeah, and here facing to the side. So um, so this is the second one in the series and it is set in the world of horse racing. Eliza's father is has joined a syndicate. Uh, they own a horse, a uh, race horse, and members of that syndicate are being killed. Uh, and so, yeah, so that was, that was really great. Um, and it's also, it's 1913, so there's a lot of, about suff the suffragettes in this one too, which I really enjoyed, I found really interesting. I do really love this series, and I've already got the third one out from the library to continue. And then I read um, something on my Kindle. I know, shocker, right? Um, it's called, uh, a novella called Silent Kill by Jane Casey. I love the Maeve Kerrigan series by Jane Casey and I've read all of them. And when I read, when I got the last one from the library, I had heard that she was writing a book from Georgia's perspective, not Maeve's. The whole series is told first person from Maeve's perspective um, and I really, really liked that. But I was intrigued when I heard that she was writing a story from George's perspective, who is another um, uh, detective on their on their team. And I thought it would be so fascinating to see the relationship between Maeve and Josh, which is like a huge part of the series, not romantic relationship, working relationship. Um, uh, through through her eyes and so when I read that last book I was really dis I was disappointed at, at first because it was from Maeve's point of view and I thought oh well, I guess maybe the author just decided not to do it but then I discovered Silent Kill and this one is was in between the penultimate book and the last book that I read and this is a novella that was told from Georgia's point of view, and I loved that. That was it was so good. It's only available on on Kindle, um, and and so I loved that. Um, I still don't like. I still don't really like Georgia. She's not a great character, but it was a really good mystery, um, and I loved that we got kind of a, a look at Maeve and Josh from someone else's perspective, and then. I finally finished Can You Forgive Her by Anthony Trollope. This has been on my 
currently reading list for a very long time. I had started it and then I just put it down and I had other things to do. And then I discovered that there was a group that were reading the Pallister novels and so uh, on Voxer. So I joined that group and I thought this is this is a great way for to kickstart me into reading this. So we read this through the months of January and February and I loved it. I loved it. I love Anthony Trollope. I love his writing style. I love the way he addresses the reader and draws them into the, his stories. I loved the characters. Yeah, I just thought it was so fantastic. So Can You Forgive Her is a story about Alice. Um, there's also a, a lot of other characters. Um, and primarily there, it's primar primarily their romantic uh, relationships. It's a book about marriage. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, and so uh, I, here's an example of his writing style and um, that gives you a hint, you know, a little more detail about this, um, the, the title, Can You Forgive Her? Whether or no she, whom you are to forgive, if you can, did or did not belong to the upper 10,000 of this, our English world, I am not prepared to say with any strength of affirmation. <laughs> oh man, Anthony Trollope. And then later in the book, 330, page 336, we have this. But can you forgive her, delicate reader? Or am I asking the question too early in my story? For myself, I have forgiven her. The story of the struggle has been present to my mind for many years, and I have learned to think that even this offense against womanhood may, with deep repentance, be forgiven. And you also must forgive her before we close the book, or else my story will have been told amiss. <laughs> okay, and then for the Library Love Readathon, I also listened to a bit from The Mysteries of Udolpho by Anne Radcliffe. This is another book that has been on my currently reading list for a very, very long time. I am slowly making my way through this. I'll pick it up, I'll put it down, I'll pick it up, I'll put it down. Um, and so one of the prompts for the Library Love Readathon was to listen to, let me get, let me get the paper. Yeah, to listen to an audio book. And so I did listen to the entire thing, but I did listen to a good uh, chunk of it on audio. Um, and I, I also thought this was a great option because of Feb, Regen Feb Regency. And this is a book that was written in the Regency. Um, it's classic Gothic, um, you know, early Gothic literature. So I'm still plugging my way through that, but that was another one for the Library Love Readathon. And then, my February pick for my 12 challenge where I asked 12 friends to recommend a book to me and I will read one per month. I read The Listening Eye by Patricia Wentworth. This was recommended to me by my wonderful friend Marilyn and I am so glad Marilyn that you recommended this to me. I love Miss Silver. This is only my second Miss Silver mystery but I, I do. I love Miss Silver and these are just fantastic um, fantastic mysteries. This one was written in the 50s, 1957. Miss Silver is a retired governess who is now a private inquiry agent. That's how she described herself in this book, which I found fascinating because Miss Marple, who was written in, in the same time period, would never have called herself that. She, she, we call her an amateur sleuth. I don't even think she would have done that. But Miss Silver is full on private inquiry agent. So, in The Listening Eye, we have Paulina Payne, who is deaf. Uh, she became deaf later in life and learned, she taught herself to read lips. And so she is at an art show um, and she reads a conversation that happens across the room between two men where uh, there she she learns that there is going to be a theft and a murder and so she doesn't know what to do with this information and she goes to miss silver uh yeah i love this one it was fantastic um the only the only thing that was like that kind of took it from a five star to a four star for me was that the the killer was kind of obvious um uh, there was a pair and, and one more obvious than the other but um, aside from that I, I really did enjoy it and I loved this description of Miss Silver 
Um, the man who hires her is, this is his impression of Miss Silver. Scrupulous accuracy, a, temper, a temperate judgment, considerable powers of observation, of these she was giving him proof. But above and beyond these qualities, he was aware of a poised and keen intelligence. It was a thing which he respected above everything else, and he had seldom been more instantly aware of it. I loved that description of Miss Silver. Okay, and then um, I also did a buddy read with Marilyn, the same Marilyn, of Taken at the Flood by um, Agatha Christie. This is the next up in my read-through project, so I am not going to talk about it now. I'm going to save that for my Agatha Christie video, but I did want to mention it because I did want to mention that I loved doing this as a buddy read with Marilyn because Marilyn and I read mysteries very differently, so it made the conversation really interesting. I read a mystery looking for the clues, trying to solve it, analyzing every little detail, and Marilyn gets just totally immersed in the story and loves the characters, and so we both saw different things, and it made the conversation really fun. And then, Last but not least, I read The Rosary Murders by William Kenzel. Kenzel? Um, this was recommended to me by Lee, one of my subscribers. She thought this was a series that I might enjoy. And so I grabbed the first one from the library. I was actually amazed that our library had a copy because this was written in 1979. It's the first in a series uh, that he wrote about Father... Uh, Father Kessler, Kessler. They are set in Detroit, um, and in in this book, um, priests and nuns are getting murdered, and the killer is leaving a rosary wrapped around their hand. Uh, so yeah, it was it was an interesting book. Thank you, Lee, for recommending this book to me. This series. Um, yeah, I thought it was interesting. It was an interesting way of telling the story. You got a lot of the police investigation. You also got a lot from um, some reporters who were who were working on the story, and then of course a lot from Father Kessler and you know the, that side of it. So it was like a really well-rounded investigation in that way. One thing that I thought was hilarious uh, was there was a scene when Father Kessler is uh, taking confession and in between confessions he's reading a murder mystery <laughs> which I thought was hilarious. <laughs> you kind of don't really think about a priest doing that and so that's it was pretty funny. There was something else that struck me as very odd um, and it has nothing to do with my enjoyment of the book or the mystery or anything but there were like at least six characters in this book who were well over six feet tall. Is that weird? So two of them were main characters. So Father Kessler was described as being over six feet tall. The, the detective, um, Koz, Koznicki, was described as uh, six four or six five, and um, the father was just like just a little bit shorter than him. Um, we get another character who is described as slightly more than six feet tall. Uh, an archbishop is taller than um, Ke Father Kessler. We also get um, a, a character, a woman who is almost six feet tall. And so for women, that I mean, that's really tall. What was with the freakishly tall people in this book? I don't understand. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> those are the books that I've read recently. I have now cleared the decks and I am ready and raring to go for March Mystery Madness. Let's chat in the comment section down below. Have you read any of these books? I would love to talk with you about them. And I will see you tomorrow for March Mystery Madness kickoff. Bye.